So, to anybody watching, um, if you post comments or questions, I will is this try to read them when there is something to talk. Yeah. 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 Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this wonderful uh, uh, science cafe, we could call it, in, uh, in this uh, cafe retro, and I think there's, there's a room enough for everyone. We have people upstairs also. Yes, very good. Uh, I was just told this is number four in a row of, uh, of, of these uh, informal uh, drinking and discussing science communication uh, events. And it's uh, something that just started here the last uh, year. I think I met Sarah the first time at the big ESOF conference in Copenhagen last summer. And um, apparently it takes a civilized person from the UK to come over and teach the people in Denmark how to do these things, because we've never had this before in Denmark. Um, I'm the moderator today. My name is Mikkel Bohm. I'm the director of the National Center for Science Education. Uh, in, uh, in Denmark, this is a new job. I used to be director for Danish Science Factory, uh, an NGO uh, that works with science communication, science events, mostly aimed at uh, children and young people. But now uh, I'm a civil servant uh, working for the uh, National Center for Science Education. Um, I'm very happy to, to say that we have a very distinguished uh, international group of speakers here today. And the task they have uh, is very simple. Each of the speakers needs to do two things. Oh, now you tell us. <laughs> two things. You have to One talk about the things that you find most interesting, and you have to keep within five minutes. Those are the things you have to do. And when you have one minute left, I'm going to make, you know, with my body language, I'm going to make it clear to you that you need to stop. And if you don't stop, I have other uh, methods. <laughs> And uh, the way we'll do it is that we will uh, have five minutes with each speaker and then we will um, keep the questions of the Q&A for afterwards, after all the speakers have finished. So if you have questions, I'm sure you have questions, please uh, make a mental note or write it down so you can be ready to participate in the, in the discussion uh, afterwards. And if any of you need oxygen or anything like that, I'm sure there will be plenty of oxygen out in the street. Otherwise, uh, I don't think we'll have a lot in here. But um, I think before, uh, uh, I should mention also that this is a live streaming uh, uh, event uh, using a system called Periscope. Uh, and Periscope is sitting down here. Uh, uh, we will be broadcasting live to the world. Is that right? We are broadcasting. We are broadcasting. Hello, everybody. Um, also, I will invite you to tweet. Uh, everything that you find interesting, there is a hashtag, and the hashtag is CPH Skycom. Uh, and I'm sure that those of you who are good at Twitter, you can uh, find ways to uh, do that. And um, yeah, so we are public in any uh, any uh, any way we can think about. Uh, so I, I think that between the speakers here, we will cover a lot of ground in different kinds of, uh, of science communication, science theater, science cafes, exhibitions, and so on and so forth. 
and I'm sure we are going to have a lot of discussion about science and uh, you know what, what what are we doing science communication for what, who is the audience and uh, are we talking about science if we should paraphrase from from the last uh, uh, three European framework programs are we talking about science and society science in society or maybe even science for and with society which I think is the current uh, trend from Brussels so um, I hope you're ready for a lot of good questions and uh, without uh, further talk I will now give the floor to our first speaker this is Adam uh, uh, from Medicines Museum and Adam please start by introducing yourself and uh, I will keep the time that's good that's good here you go All right. Hi everyone, really nice to see so many people here. So my name is Adam, uh, I work at the Medical Museum, which is the University of Copenhagen's Museum for the History and Culture of Medicine. Um, I'm an assistant professor in, in science communication. Um, I'm actually going to start by bragging a little bit. I thought we were at a bar, so I figured it would be okay to just brag a little bit. So earlier this year at the museum, we won a Danish Museum Award. So we got three million kroners to do an exhibition an exhibition contact is the Bikuben Fonten's um, Exhibition Award Vision 2015. And it's for a concept called Mind the Gut, which is an exhibition on gut brain microbiome interaction research. Right? So this idea that the gut and the brain and bacteria actually actually interact much more than we think, and maybe even that you or you as persons are floating around somewhere in that mixture between uh, stomach, brain and bacteria. Now, um, we were pretty happy with that. Uh, we won it in competition with all the, the, the kind of major museum players in Denmark, but I think it signals something which I'd like to start out with, which is the fact that if you talk about the state of the art of science, of science communication, it is that it's pretty good, right? We're getting more and more attention. We're getting more and more resources fueled towards uh, science communication. We'll see, uh, we're being contacted by uh, the scientists we work with to collaborate on Marie Curie scholarships and provide outreach opportunities for these things. So the state of science communication is that it's good, right? But this also means that we have to start thinking more seriously about how and why we do it. Now, um, I'll actually uh, focus on the what. So what kind of an image of science do we want to portray? Started thinking about that and I'll talk about what we're gonna do in our exhibition, but also how do we want to do it? So with the what first. Now, with Mind the Gut, we're particularly interested in communicating science as a process, right? So we want people to understand how science is done, what the process actually looks like, how our experiments being designed, uh, what does the actual process look, look like? We want to uh, uh, get people to get a feel for the lab, get a feeling for cutting edge metabolic research and what it looks like. We want to communicate science as a process, but we also want to communicate science in process. And this is why this topic is particularly interesting for us. Much of the research on gut-brain bacteria interaction is still ongoing. It is undecided. You might look back 10 years from now and say, you know, that bacteria thing, that was a bust. Uh, but that, although that's probably not gonna happen, but, uh, <laughs> but it is really science in process. So there is an, a double opportunity for both talking about science in and as process. So that is the image of science that we want to portray. Now, as for the how, what we want to do and what we've been working with at the Museum is emphasizing material and effective encounters with science. We might be biased because we're in a museum and a house full of stuff, but uh, we still think that stuff and things offer us a unique opportunity for engaging with exactly science as a process. We've been working for uh, the past seven, eight years, uh, combining science communication and medical humanities research, uh, and a lot, done a lot of practical experiments. And we've developed what we call a kind of material aesthetic approach. Right. So we combine art installations, events, uh, small experimental exhibitions, and they've all been developed in collaboration between curators, artists, and biomedical researchers. And we've been particularly uh, keen on emphasizing a sensory approach in order to make scientific research tangible. And we think it's a kind of shortcut to say something about science as a process. So if you want people to understand how work in the lab done is actually done, 
you can use the objects as a shortcut and get people to understand how it functions. <coughs> All right. So in mind the gut, we'll have scientists and curators that collaborate to devise with the with the with artists to make the actual exhibition displays. We don't want artists just commenting from the sidelines. We don't just want scientists who provide background info and curators all hiding behind long lists of texts in the beginning of the exhibition. No, we want a true collaborative interactive process where art, science, and science communication blends together. Now, uh, we want to sort of uh, use that to ask the questions that pop out of the research, which concerns all of us. Who are we really stuck somewhere in between mind and gut? Thank you. Very well done. Science as a process. Keep that in mind. And um, why don't we say cheers? And cheers, cheers, everybody. Cheers. Our next speaker is uh, from far away, Arizona. Uh, um, is that in uh, is that Phoenix you're from? Or around Phoenix. Uh, yeah. Around Phoenix, yes, it's a very hot place. And uh, I just told you a little bit of Danish. Mm -hmm. Can you remember the name of the beer? It's gone. Fynsk Fall. Fynsk Fall. Fynsk Fall, yeah. that's it. <laughs> Megan Halpern from um, Arizona. Arizona, yes. <laughs> excited to be here and not just because it's cool <laughs> it's so hot where I am right now um, but I'm also I've had this wonderful week here um, meeting with wonderful scholars from Copenhagen from around Europe and um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of my projects um, and one of the things that I'm most excited about so first my background is science theater uh, and since 2000 I've produced works um, about science in collaboration with scientists some of them have involved um, improvisational actors, actors who just on the fly make things up. And um, I've always done this with scientists, and this time around, um, I was very interested in working with ideas that came from members of the public. Um, and I was involved in a, pro in a program called Emerge uh, at Arizona State University that was a, um, an idea about thinking about the future, reimagining, reinventing the future. So we created something called the Future Design Studio, where we had members of the public, people who attended this festival, come in and work with us and build um, out of cardboard and markers and clay um, prototypes of artifacts from the future, um, all kinds of artifacts from the future. And then we took these artifacts and we looked at them and we had these improv actors look at them and we had them build scenes around these artifacts from the future and just sort of the idea was to look at what somebody would create out of fun. Somebody would, would just sort of imagine what would what what does it look like in the future? And we gave them we began with a prompt, a design prompt in the form of a fortune cookie, like you get at a Chinese restaurant, uh, that had a um, a special fortune in it that was a question about the future. How do we walk our dog in the future? Uh, what does the first date look like in the future? What do we do with our dead in the future? A question like that. And we had people start from there and then create these objects and then turn them over to the improv actors um, to have some fun and some play and to play with them. Uh, but through that play to start to explore what kind of values are embedded in our designs. What do we not, what do we not even think about when we imagine the future that, that's sort of behind our ideas. Um, so to give you um, an idea, the, the example, the, the artifact that was chosen by the audience for the improv actors to play with was called the DateBot 2000. Um, it was designed by one of the participants. It was a robot that taught you how to date. So it was very clear about this. It wasn't a robot that would be your date, but would teach you how to date. So it was programmed with um, ways of being intimate, ways of kissing, ways of understanding and, and being emotionally connected to people. And so when, we, so when the improv actors got a hold of this, they really played with what does it mean to have an artificial intelligence help you learn to be more human? And that became a really sort of fun and, and actually quite funny process and thing to think about. And one, you know, for example, one of the things that happened in one of the scenes was a son finding his father's old date bot. And then the question is, do you allow your son to use the robot that taught you how to date his mother? Um, <laughs> so that was the, the Future Design Studio. And we're now starting to build this and do this in other places. And one of the things that I'm really excited about and really looking forward to thinking about 
is how people in different environments and different situations and different places think differently about the future. Um, we saw some trends. How much time do I have left? You have uh, two minutes. Okay. So we saw some trends. We saw sort of two things that happened um, when people were thinking about the future in our future design studio. They would either design um, like the next generation of technologies that they had now, consumer technologies that they had now, things like instead of having your iPad, you'd have a screen in your arm. Or instead of having your um, talking on the phone, you would talk it to a hologram. So it was sort of this next iteration for the same kinds of things we're doing now. Um, or we saw people try to radically transform in some way to make something really new. So, you know, we saw a couple of different devices that would control the weather and reverse climate change, things like that. Um, and so we sort of divided these into these two categories and we said these aspirational technologies, they teach us a lot about our hopes and dreams. But these sort of more iterative, mundane technologies are teaching us a lot about at least what people in Arizona um, think technological innovation looks like. It, and, and sort of, it had a very consumer kind of feeling to it. It had, you know, people would even put in language like this part is sold separately, or you have to wait for the update or the upgrade. And so they were sort of thinking about it in the kind of ways that they were already marketed to. And so I'm, I'm very interested now to see if that kind of language repeats itself in other places, in other ways, or if there are different ways that people interact and understand technology around the world, around the United States, and in other places. Um, and so that's the sort of story of the um, future design studio and where it's been and where it's going. Um, so I think I will stop it. <laughs> Very interesting approach to uh, uh, to designing yes. uh, exhibits, uh, demand driven or user driven. It's yes. uh, that's, that's that's very interesting. Now we go to um, to the Danish uh, Science Center Experimentarium. Uh, we have uh, uh, Christopher here, and um, present yourself, and you have five minutes. Hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Musman, and I'm from the Danish Science Center Experimentarium or what's left of it, because uh, we had a fire recently, so it's not really going that well. <laughs> and yeah, by the way, our temporary exhibition is at the end of some unfinished bridge, so people can't really seem to find it, so... Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, equally depressing uh, is the state of science journalism. I'm a science journalist at Experimentarium, and things are really not going that well, too. So, um, what is wrong? Well, it seems like science journalism is just stuck in some, I don't know, weird place in time, some, some weird place. I mean, we have been doing the same kind of stories for ages. We find a recipe and we stick to it. Ah, let me take an example. Some of you might know uh, the Danish neuro researcher Milena Penkova, who was uh, really hot a couple of years ago. <laughs> she was really coming up with those these fantastic results. She was just really in all the big journals. She was doing all the right things. Became a professor at a really long, uh, young age. And then somebody started to ask questions. Hey, what about those research results? How did you get them? And things started to fall apart. But who was that guy who started to ask these questions? Well, he was definitely not a science journalist. <laughs> and he told me once, hey, you know, this could never have been done like a guy like you. So why not? Well, the problem is, in science journalism, we tend to praise the researchers. We don't really ask them the difficult questions. We just uh, really wait for the results to be published. Then we look in nature, we look in science, see, wow, they really have something really special going on here. They are so close to, to solving, uh, to find a cure for cancer, finding a cure for whatever. The truth is, they're probably not. There's probably really far away. They just got good press releases that can uh, get us on the track and write about them. So, I think if I should get somewhere uh, near the future of science journalism, that we should focus on something different. Perhaps it would be smarter in science journalism to try to do the stories before they're published, go into the, the laboratories, go out and meet the researchers where they are instead of waiting up, uh, on a press release. 
it takes a little more time, but actually it makes way better journalism. I mean, why, how, how can it be that the, all the big foundations in Denmark seem to, to decide what should be uh, uh, researched upon? That's a question I would like to uh, dig into. And um, what about all the things that, that we don't really have a cure for yet or that we're working on? I mean, malaria has been a research area for ages. Nothing really happens there. Why not? What is, uh, what's the interest here? That's not a field for science journalists, that seems to be a field for just ordinary journalism, journalists, and that's really a shame. So, uh, well, I think I just want to conclude and say science journalists need to get up from their chairs and out into the real world. Thank you very much. <laughs>
RRI, Res Responsible Research and Innovation, wasn't mentioned at any point, I have to say, in the two days, except by me. And then I was taken aside later by someone who said, don't you know it's dead? RRI, that's, that's, that's old news. We have a new commissioner. Now, what you're wondering is, where does science communication come into this? Well, at one point, Carlos Muedas, the, the commissioner, got very excited and kind of went under the table. There was a big conference hall. And he got out this box and he said, you know, special thank you to the uh, uh, vice uh, president of Manchester University. And he produced what basically was like the thing above my head, but you can't see a light bulb. Um, and he was excitedly, and then he kind of went down and he switched this thing on. And it was a light bulb. It was a very bright light bulb, I have to say, but it was indeed a light bulb. What was special? It was graphene. So the whole point of graphene, the thing that won the Nobel Prize uh, to Manchester University just a few years ago, was its potential for innovation. The science, in that sense, I have to say, was less important than that. So where does science communication come into this? Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the challenge for science communication is to find a place um, in that kind of context. I mean, what is the role of science communication in this world of Europe open to innovation? Um, that's the context for contemporary science communication, as far as I can see, and that tight linkage between science and innovation, you can see it as a good thing or you can see it as a bad thing, but that's where we are. Um, what does Europe open for innovation even mean? No one even talked about the kind of innovation, it was just innovation. I like change, you know, let's have change, that's great. Um, if my wife comes home and says she wants change, I get a little nervous. Um, but, you know, innovation in itself is a good thing. What does that mean? I guess I think the role of science communication, and it follows with some of the comments, has got to be to ask some critical questions about this kind of agenda. I'm not against innovation, don't get me wrong, but just being in favor of innovation or graphing things that make lights shine bright um, seems to be missing something very important. I think we ought to talk about that. And you couldn't help but feel, when you listen to open science on the one hand and open innovation on the other, that there's a little thing called democracy or open society, which is a great risk of being uh, squeezed in between. No one was talking about uh, democracy, as I said, no one was talking about open innovation. So having a Europe which is open to an era of innovation is interesting in all ways, but the hot question for me is what role can science communication play in that discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'm going to break my rules just for one second because Christopher had an ultra short comment. <laughs> sure. I just heard that Alan said that RRI is dead. I do not agree because tomorrow morning Experimentarium is going to the Ruskiller Festival with a complete RRI roadshow. So <laughs> it's totally rock and roll down there. So you should. Uh, I'll be there. <laughs> So, so, so come, uh, come by if you're down there, that would really be fun. It's at the city center east, and uh, we do a lot of future stuff. What will the Ruskula Festival look like 30 years from now? And you can taste uh, insects and tasty soap bubbles and uh, play along with a lot of future uh, VR gear and stuff like that. Yeah, so come by. <laughs> I just want to say, I'm thrilled about that, and I'll be there, um, also with Paul McCartney. And I'm not saying that RRI is dead, I'm just saying this is kind of the, the way it works in, in Brussels, that things are in fashion one moment and they're out of fashion the next. So we want this to be more than just a fashion, that we need to do just the kind of things that you're talking about. That, that's my point. Okay, now I can see I can see some energy here, and people have questions. I'm going to stop it now and give the floor to Anne from uh, the Netherlands. And uh, you're going to talk about all these nice little things in the under on the tables, right? Yeah. Underneath the drinks. Here you go. That's, tr that's true. Thank you very much. My name is Anna Dijkstra. I'm not only a science communication scholar, but I, I'm also a volunteer at the Science Cafe in the city where I live. So I put on some coasters. But first I have some questions for you. Who, um, except for this one, is called the Science Cafe as well. Who went to a Science Cafe before? In Denmark, who did? Probably in the UK. Okay, and um, you as well. So um, then I, I don't have. Well, I also have a second question. Who organized the science cafe as well? Because 
probably there's no one in the in Denmark as there regular is, science cafes. There, there, there is a, a science cafe organized in Denmark. Okay, that's good. There to used know. to be. I'm not sure if there's there anymore. Oh, that's good. There used to, know. to be one. Because in my opinion, science cafes are. Because I had to talk about the successes of science communication. Science cafe is an example of a success. We organize uh, ten times per year each month. We organize a science cafe, and I think it's uh, visited by more than 120 people each time. So sometimes we even have 350 people attending. And in the science cafe, it, the scientist is giving a space to talk about his or her research for about one hour. Um, characteristic is the informal swear. And um, um, we have also in, in, in Deventer where I live, we have a band playing so people can relax a little bit, buy a beer and uh, uh, then discuss uh, after the talk uh, the topic with the scientists because there's one, also one hour room for uh, questions and discussions and they really appreciate it because we um, do some advertisement for example by these little leaflets but also we put up bigger uh, um, brochures, folders and we have a website as well but uh, it's really interesting because everyone, uh, well, we have so many people attending each time. Um, for example, um, the topics they are talking about are interesting. We had once, we had a, a scientist talking about the discovery of the Majorana particle the day before his uh, article in Nature was published. So that was interesting. We had some interesting uh, topics about, for example, the social robot. But we had also one from the well related to the the city where I live in about the archeo archaeological uh, um, uh, remains that were found in our city. We I live in a pretty uh, old city which has uh, medieval remains. So that's really interesting because when you walk around now in the city, I can point out places where they found really interesting uh, remains. And um, I did bring these toast coasters because I think uh, it sort of symbolizes the informal sphere at the, at the, at the Science Cafe. And, um, um, well, this is also a, me a means of getting sponsoring, because on the back side we have a sponsor, so he pays for, for so money to, to get his um, logo on the, on the back side. And, um, well, I think in the Netherlands at least, at the Science Cafe is a success, so I would um, well, maybe uh, stimulate you to organize science cafes also in Denmark. And for that, I would like to get my get my beer and tell something about um, why the beer is also symbolizing. Oh, oops, why the beer is also symbolizing um, uh, the scientific element because we couldn't have been we couldn't be in a in a science cafe or in a, ca a cafe drinking beer without uh, scientific research and without the second um, uh, technological uh, revolution in which took place about in the 1880s. Uh, from that time on, uh, before that time, it was only possible to produce beer uh, in the area of Bavaria, because that was uh, cold enough in the winter time and it was um, a slow process. And in the caves, they could brew the beers, but when the second uh, uh, revolution, the uh, second technological revolution came, it was possible to uh, place, to um, move the process into large factories. And uh, by means of the knowledge of chemical processes that uh, were, became known, it was possible to uh, produce beer in large quantities. So um, I will end with this talk with um, then um, stimulating you to um, do a toast, I give a toast, oh, how do you say that? Yeah, on, scope, uh, scope. Scope on the, on the, on the well, scientific and technological uh, developments that make uh, science cafes happen. So, scroll. Finally, somebody said something about beer. Thank you yes. for that. <laughs> yes. Um, so the next speaker is uh, from Bristol, from the Science Communication uh, Unit, Eric Stengler. Please. Okay, good evening everyone. You already said where I, where I've come from to, 
to this meeting. Um, so I'm not going to spend time introducing myself further because I'm going to be very provocative this time at the risk of not being talked to by my colleagues, let alone invited to such events anymore. <laughs> because my answer to the question about the state of the art of science communication is that it is an anomaly. So why I'm saying that? Well, have you ever heard of a economics slam or a law cafe <laughs> or an architecture, uh, I don't know, event, festival, things like that, that we do with science, but we don't do with other subjects. So why, why has the science communication grown as a profession and has become the focus of attention like no other topic has become a focus of attention and of studies and of research and of course a whole profession? Why has this happened? Well, one answer, probably not the only one, is that researchers don't get out there to talk about their stuff like the people in these other areas do with normality. Another answer is, of course, in the hands of the science education people, that maybe if education achieved a general substrate of scientific knowledge that didn't then need to be reinforced by extraordinary measures, well, then this anomaly will have happened. But in relation to the first part of scientists not getting out there to talk about their topics like architects, economists, and uh, lawyers do, uh, and then we see, as a consequence of that, all these areas depicted in films and in movies and novels with all normality. Um, I think my wishful thinking for the future is that we achieve that, and therefore that the anomaly disappears. And that's why I say they're not going to talk to me anymore, because what I'm saying is that science, science communication as a profession disappears. But I think that would restore symmetry in all this. As a physicist, I like symmetry and order, and I think this anomaly is a bit of an unbalance. So what would scientists need to normalize this? Well, I think this will at least in part be achieved when scientists realize that what everyone wants when we meet in a pub or in a cafe or with our friends after a busy day. What, what we look for with them, or watching TV, or watching a football game, are stories. If you think about, even a football game is a story that has a beginning, a, a development, and an end. Adverts try to be stories to attract our attention. Everything that we look for in our Free time are stories, songs. We like songs, and there are, there's a story embedded in songs. So if if scientists realize that what people want is stories, so if they tell their stories with normality, they will not be around, out there trying to sell encyclopedias to people who don't want it. <laughs> they would be telling people what they want to hear, which is stories. If, if scientists ever come to this realization, I think they will feel empowered to do it, and science communication as an anomaly will disappear. Of course, I, I can clarify and uh, do some, some specific uh, examples of science communication would, would still remain, because of course there are people studying how history is communicated, so you would still have people studying how science is communicated, but not in with in the size and with the extent of this anomaly that I think. I don't know what you think, but that's my provocative point of view. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. And uh, the last speaker now is uh, Rasmus. He comes from the excellent Danish newspaper called Information, or as we say in Denmark, Information. Please. Thank you. Should I move somewhere else? Uh, this is good? All right, thank you. So my name is Rasmus, and um, the task is to talk about something that's really interesting to me, which would be me. So I'll talk a little bit about my career. No, joking aside, uh, the thing is that uh, I've been in my new position as head of uh, content development at Information for a total of 25 days now. 
So it's, uh, it's from a fairly new position that I'll be talking, but I do think that my, um, my uh, change from my last job to my new job says a little bit about science communication. Before uh, I started my new job, I was at uh, Gildendal, which is a Danish publishing house, which is the oldest and the biggest, and it's nearing 250 years now. In 2020, it'll be 250 years old. I was the editor-in-chief of their non-fiction list, and um, I did traditional publishing. Now I'm the, um, the head of content development at Information, and what we try to do there is a different way of publishing in a very broad sense. So my point would be that I, well, I hope that I've moved from from a, a, a monological way of publishing to a dialogical way, and I. I hope, again, that this is a uh, larger trend, that I, I'm betting my career that it is, basically. <laughs> but I do think it is. I think that what we're seeing in science communication is a, um, is a move from a tendency to sort of enlighten the people, just uh, laying down a huge tome of 800 pages of science communication on the table, and then they can buy it or they can not buy it to a more dialogical approach uh, where you try and, and, and uh, create a conversation with the public. Um, in, as, a, uh, as working for, uh, for a media house, we're sort of intermediary in that sense, but, but I think the whole, um, the whole trend is basically to, to uh, sort of uh, dissolve some of these boundaries. So you have science on one side and the public on the other side, that's a sort of an old school way of thinking about it, I think. Um, I think we need to talk, uh, to think about it as, uh, as, a, as a different kind of conversation. So, um, at Information, um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's a media house, it's a, it's a publishing house, it's a newspaper, and it's a media bureau, or whatever you want to call it, um, that does a lot of uh, great events. It does uh, uh, specialized publishing, so they have special newspapers on science and on youth and on travel and stuff like that. But um, I would want to point to two things that has specifically attracted me to do this uh, move from, from uh, the traditional kind of publishing to, to a more um, I think contemporary way of looking at it, which would be um, the uh, something that's called the uh, media school, Informations Media School, which was created two years ago and and uh, is a school for PhD students um, and young researchers that go through a uh, one week course of basically learning how to find the uh, the story in their in their research and, and uh, bring it to the public in a way where you still respect the essence of science. And so it's not a school of uh, uh, juggling and, and being funny uh, on behalf of your research, but it's a, it's, it's a way where you try and take researchers and prepare them for what they will need if they actually engage with uh, modern media. So there's a, there's a class on um, what, what's the story of your of your research? Of the class on how do you perform on live television, and they go through all these things. This, about 160 PhD students has gone through the program now, and it's been a huge success. Everybody's very happy about it. And what I think is great about it is it's kind of an e ecosystem, so that it's not just that they go through a program and then they're better at, at, at talking about the research. It's more in the sense that they go through this program and we get to know them and the newspaper get to know them and they get to know the newspaper and in the long run we'll have a community where research is not something foreign but something that we can actually talk about and write about and discuss in public in a different way. The other, um, the other uh, thing that Information does which I think is, is very attractive is they have this PhD cup. A lot of you might have heard about it. It's um, you, uh, you turn in a, I think it's an eight-page uh, proposal as a young researcher, and then there's a panel, and they choose eight uh, researchers, and then they go on stage at the Danish National Public Television Broadcasting, whatever, <laughs> and um, they compete. They compete on stage on being the best at telling what their research is all about. 
It might sound uh, light needed, but it's really not. It's, I think it's a way of respecting science and the audience. And the audience. And I think, I think uh, both is quite important. And you stand there and it seems like I'm done. Good. Well, I got to say the things that I wanted to say. So thank you. Wonderful. And I can say I've participated in all these PhD cups, and it's uh, it's absolutely excellent. It's, it's very very good. So I think before we move on, we should have a big round of applause for all the speakers, please. And I must say you all behaved very nicely in discipline. So thank you for thank you for that. Now we we have something like a little bit more than half an hour for questions. And we're not able to pass the microphone around in the room. So what I'm going to ask you when you post a question is that you try to shout and you start by saying who you are. And then you, uh, you can address the, the question to the panel as a whole, or you can address the question to somebody in particular. Uh, so I will now open the floor uh, uh, for questions. So please go ahead. Who will be the first? We have one in the back, please. Hello, I'm Richard, and I look after international press and the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Copenhagen. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Yes. So actually, it's a, a question to you, Christopher, because obviously we do science communication, and you were discussing the idea of allowing someone, possibly a journalist, to be closer to the scientist while they're doing the research before the research is presented. It's a very interesting idea because we're always looking for different ways to present research. But how realistic is that? <laughs> Can it be done? Well, that's a really good question. Um, of course, it's not the easiest thing to do, easiest thing to do at all. But I think it's possible. I just think that the researchers are just so used to not making mistakes. And there is, when I phone someone and ask, "Hey, can I come by and just see what you're doing at your place?" They say, "Ah, no, nah, no. Nah. Well, the phone would be better. Email is really the best way to communicate because then you can just <laughs> write down uh, the." the perfect sentences and you can have them check with your boss and then you're absolutely sure that nothing goes wrong. So, um, well, I think you should just be a little more, have a little more courage as a science journalist and, and, and try just to, well, <laughs> work, work on it and, and, and make, make, them, make them confident that it's not that embarrassing to show their mistakes. It's not it's not a huge problem that, that they don't uh, make a bullseye the first time. Maybe it's actually could be nice to, to change the way we, we see uh, see how science is done and, and our views on scientists uh, as, as a public. I may, may comment on that because in a way that's kind of what we try to do with, with this exhibition that we're building. We really want to to work with the scientists while they do their research projects. So we've contacted a number of postdocs and, and kind of gotten in from the beginning of the research process. And, and I think part of what, what it takes is start asking questions about the results, <laughs> right? We always talk about the results. And while the results are, are of course important, they're shifting. Right? And one of the big problems with science communication, the way it's been done, is that it, is, it has all been about the results. And that communicates, I think, a problematic image of science. Because science isn't about the results. Science is also about the ongoing process. Mm -hmm. And so what we're, what we're trying to do is to say, we got to talk about the process. we got to show how it's done. And you can do that. And you can let people into the lab. And you can bring stuff out of the lab and show it to people and give them a sense of how it's done without spoiling whatever results they're coming up with. So, so I think there are th the answer is to try to ask other questions rather than just ask what, what's going to come out of it. How is it being done? What sort of bigger questions does it raise? What does it talk about the big picture of science? How are the, how the experiments being set up? What's involved in that? Then you'll get communication about the process. It, it reminds me that the, the former ad, uh, chief advi scientific advisor to the um, 
uh, to Barroso in the European uh, uh, Commission uh, and Glover. She, she said once that science is not about answers, science is about questions. And I think it's a very, very good point that we should take care not to just uh, communicate answers. So uh, very interesting. Next question, please. Yes. Yeah, Shout. To Rasmus from the mm -hmm. You said that you're going to change to a more dialogue approach in your journalism. How are you going to implement that in regards to science journalism? Actually, not in the journalism, but in the whole way of approaching uh, being a media house, being a modern media. I think uh, traditional publishing is very much about you care extremely much for the product and, and for the process finishing the product. And once you finish the product and it comes from the printer, you forget about it. It's basically out there and you might move in a few ads in the newspapers and that's it. Whereas I think the interesting thing now would be to care more about the product afterwards, about the conversation that it can create. And that would be in terms of having seminars and having having uh, morning meetings and, and having uh, also having blogs that invite the readers of the newspaper to, to, uh, to have their uh, approach to things published as well. So it's, it's more like that. It's not so much in terms of how the, uh, the journalists uh, do things. Comment over here. Um, maybe I can add something. Um, I'm involved, oh, well, I'm um, sort of member of the science journalist community, the, the freelancers in the, in the Netherlands. And uh, one comforting remark is that we had a fraud um, example in the Netherlands as well. And the interesting thing was that the science journalists did discuss it in their um, um, email conversations beforehand, but they didn't take any actions. But the thing is, I, I think what is important is if you have a long-term relationship with science, scientists and researchers, it's easier to approach them and to, to ask questions beforehand. So then, then you, maybe you know about running research and you, don't, you, you cannot publish about it, but when it's there, then you have, a more, you have another story. You have a, a, a bigger picture of what is going on, probably. one just before. I have plenty, but I'll take yeah. my microphone. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, and I'll try and be concise. I've had two beers, so it's harder now uh, to be precise. I wasn't invited to speak. Um, my name's Kiri. I'm a PhD who did some science communication and now is in marketing. So I've kind of covered all the fields. I'm going to bring up an article I read recently, which I think is kind of covers a lot of the topics that a lot of people are talking about. Um, a group of scientists in Australia decided they were going to try and test an idea called confirmation bias. And they decided they were going to come up with a topic that was so exciting for people to read, and they were going to test how they could put it through the system. So they took 15 people and they divided them into three groups of five. And they assigned a different treatment to each of these three groups. So one group got put on a normal diet, one got, group got put on a, a low carbohydrate diet, Another group got put on a low carbohydrate diet and get, was given a bar of chocolate. What they did with these three groups is they measured so many parameters that um, just by the act of coincidence, some of these parameters would become scientifically or statistically uh, different between the groups. What came out of this was that the group that was put on a low carbohydrate diet with a bar of chocolate lost weight faster than any of the other groups, but overall, none of the groups lost weight. What this group did then was wrote a paper, put it through a, um, uh, an open journal online that had no peer review. It was accepted within 24 hours. The authors of the paper then took that and they wrote a press release that was so exciting for journalists that they all picked it up. If you eat chocolate, you will lose weight. So they fed it to the journalists. It got picked up by about seven major media outlets, including Australia, Denmark, Germany, the US, India, and I think Japan. It's incredible that you can just write something and it can just go through if you want to believe it. And I'm gonna get, I think half of you can probably comment on this. There's two science journalists, uh, Rasmus from Information, um, Christopher, you're a science journalist too. Um, these ideas of, of giving the public something they want to believe and what science journalism actually means in terms of what you're trying to do. 
so using that as an example, I'll just ask you guys to comment on what this means because this got published and then about three, week, three weeks later, the authors of the journal came out and said, this is not real. We need to pick up our game. Do we need to pick up our game as science communicators? Well, it adds to the, what I said before. It's the long-term relationship you have with scientists. If you have, um, if you talk to them more often, to researchers, then you know maybe that you can check it more easily because you don't have much time to check the facts if you have the deadline ahead, probably. So it's a bit of luck, but also a bit of experience with other cases, maybe. So, well, it's maybe it's not good what happened, but it will happen again if you but I think deliberately. The idea of this is that it's so ridiculous to think that chocolate's going to help you lose weight. Yeah. But still, it got picked up as something. It's so ridiculous. I mean, let's think about this as, you know, scientists yeah. and journalists. It's stupid, but people <laughs> wanted to believe it. Yes. And this is the idea behind it. Yeah, How do you, you can, it's so easy to sell something you want to buy. Yeah, I think that's yeah. really easy. It's that's really so, easy, yeah. yeah and, and that was the idea of the study. It was so easy that it almost feels silly afterwards. Well, I, I do agree, and uh, it just shows the problem of just, well, writing off from the, from the press releases. Uh, well, so definitely another pro approach is, 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 is needed. But still, well, you know, you have deadlines, you have really just, as a tight time schedule, so sometimes mistakes will will occur, but yeah, still <laughs> other, other types of, of journalists, uh, journalism would, would be uh, yeah, appropriate. Yeah. Now, we have some questions. We have this gentleman in the shirt and then the lady in uh, yellow and then the lady over here. Mm -hmm. So please. Sure. Yeah. This is also a slightly general question, but mostly in regards to what uh, Eric and uh, Rasmus were talking about with the power of stories, also in relation to what we just talked about. Because you've mentioned that scientists can use the power of stories to their advantage to communicate science and use the media to tell these stories, but what about the other way around? Because we have to compete with the way the media tells stories about science and movies tell stories about science and uh, all the other, everything else. So how can we, as scientists, compete with the other stories being told about science by non-scientists? Well, I think the answer is that there shouldn't be our stories and the other stories, stories, just stories. So I mean, it's not about competing with them. It's feeding stories to the journalists. It's feeding stories to the movies. It's telling stories about what you did as a scientist during the day when you meet other people at the pub. Uh, usually what happens is that the guy who works in a, in a football team tells what the team did that week. And the guy who works in a factory talks about the last strike and it's a little story and everyone can have a little go at it. And the scientist doesn't say anything because he feels it's not going to come across and if I have to simplify it too much, it will betray my research. So if we get used to making that normal with the help of science education and, and so on, then maybe it, it's not these stories and the other stories, it's just one more, it's part of life. <laughs> I think it's very much a question of, of sort of extending the whole idea of a story so that you don't think of the, the press release as this is my story. I've worked on this research for eight years or ten years or two years or whatever and now I have to comprise, comprise it to ten lines and then I'll have to be on television for two minutes and talk about it. I think the, the challenge is to look at a bigger picture and find other uh, simultaneous releases of your story that will sort of deepen the story. I mean, a, a good story is not told in two minutes, no matter whether it's science or literature or whatever it is. I know you have to compete with the fast news, but you can do the fast news and you can do the long news at the same time. And that makes for a, a community, I think. And that, that would be my uh, approach. Just add, add one idea. Another, another idea to take into account is that Sometimes scientists, we scientists think that the story we have to tell is about our research. People want to know about us, about, they want to know about your story, what you did that day, how difficult it was for you to go to work this morning. 
it's not so much about research. It will pop up as you speak, but it's about telling stories about yourselves or about ourselves. And that's maybe the most difficult part. I'll just uh, add to that um, by saying that I think while stories are important, it's also important to not be caught up in a kind of everything is a narrative mode. Because in a way, one of the things that particular about science is the fact that it covers stuff that falls outside a kind of standard narrative approach. It has stuff in it. It has things that are related to nature. So, so it tells different stories. So rather than trying to compete with those who are expert storytellers, one should perhaps work more to highlight the things about science that separates it from those kind of stories. Of course, then making another story, but at least it's a story that, that has other qualities to it. I don't know if we can reach over there. There's a comment here. It was just a follow-up question. So it seems like right now in the Danish media, for, for many years we've had this more and more and faster and faster and social media and so on. But right now we have, among others, a, a news um, a media house called Setland, who's trying to make uh, news slower and like less but more. And so I was just wondering, do you see the same kind of trend within science communication that people want more thorough news, but not necessarily more news? It's, the format is called singles, as okay. far as, yeah, yeah. as, yeah? Anybody wants to comment? Slow news, long news, long stories? Anybody? I think that's pointing to a, uh, a, a actually a global trend that, that that's where uh, communication is moving as a sort of, or at least the newspapers are now realizing that they will never survive in the competition of, of uh, breaking news. I mean, everybody's there and we can't compete with the internet anyways, at least not if we think we should print it on paper. So what do you do? Do you try and compete with that or do you move in a totally different um, direction. I think what's really interesting is that you have this uh, general narrative about the younger people that are extremely fast and very good at their iPhones or whatever. Um, but those are the ones that have blogs where they write extremely long articles. I mean, I, I'm thinking, where do they get the time? But I'm very impressed. And, I, and they, have, they have conversations there that I think are really, really interesting. And I think they sort of show a new way of communicating. And Again, as in the story discussion, it's not an either a, either or. I mean, we need the, the fast news as well. You wanted the football results. You want it now, right? Yeah. But you don't. You, there are other things you want in a different perspective, and I think that's how the media is sort of shifting. We we are moving on very many levels at the same time, and that's that's what we need to do, and that goes for science communication as well. But we're talking as if science communication is completely different from yeah. communication. I mean, a lot of it around an issue like global warming, climate change, I mean, that's communication. And science is one part of that issue, but it's not the whole issue. And, it, and it's not so easy to separate out the scientific parts of the discussion around global warming from all the, the difficult political, economic, social, all the things that we know. So perhaps the job of science communication is to put that thing together which you won't get when you just see individual bites of news. You know, how does this relate to what we hear about scientific opinion? How does that relate to what happened in COP uh, in 2009 or what's going on in Paris later this year? It's communication that we're talking about, not a separate world. And speaking about slow and fast media and the fast media, maybe it's too much to say that Twitter is going wild, but at least there are several posts now and they're coming in every minute. So please use the hashtag here, CPH Skycom. Okay, and now we have uh, the lady in the back here, please. Oh, I was checking the Twitter feed. Yes. <laughs> I was just, please yeah. say who you are. Oh, my name is Fabiana and I work for Sustainia, which actually works with translating a lot of science into language that consumers can understand and act on. Um, and based on that, I was just wondering whether journalism maybe isn't the right medium for science communication in terms of the criteria that it takes to create news, where science might move slower and have less exciting results. Should we even bother about translating it to journalists and just maybe just bypass them and go to the people who need it? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> <Another way for laughs> I can. Yeah. 
I, I, I'm from a museum, so I'm totally biased here. <laughs> but, but I think one of the one of the things that, that science communication often gets caught up in is this sense in which the news media is the end all and be all of communication, right? If you can get in the newspaper, you're golden. But I think what, what, what social media and, and other forms of communication is showing more and more is that there is a deep qualitative aspect that often gets ignored in the rush for more clicks or more reads. Like, is it better to have 10,000 likes on Facebook compared to having 100 people in a room that are being intently aware for an hour? What matters more in the longer run? And I think that's one of the really key things about science communication right now is not to be caught up in this news from and, and take seriously that it offers different stories at different levels. So working with different formats that are more well suited to bring about intense, effective, thought-provoking, material aesthetic experiences is one of the avenues that I see other than which science communication has, has always been good at but needs to work more on. Okay, um, we have one question over here and I've seen you and now I'm looking upstairs and see because we have people upstairs too. If anybody upstairs wants to ask questions, please try to make eye contact or drop something down. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Over here. Hello, my name is Katrina. I'm a historian of science. Uh, jumping back to the chocolate that makes you uh, smaller, how much I wish that was true. Um, I also think it's a problem and it proves the fact that we actually taught scientists the journalistic criteria, that it has to be something new that breaks up all format. The ideas and, and and that's why science press releases always have to be oh we we change the theory about this um, so we also have to think about actually teaching scientists as you said to to also tell us other stories themselves and also about the person the process the need to explain something the that's it but actually my question was for I think Eric you said that science communication was an anomaly because other uh, subjects didn't have communication like law or economics or architecture, but I would actually argue that all these things would benefit from having communicators, that they are the anomaly. What do you think about that? <laughs> That's one way to look at it, but apparently they haven't perceived the necessity because we get people visiting our, uh, museums of architecture, we get people buying, buying uh, novels based on lawsuits suits we get people you know uh, following economists in order to predict what's going to happen uh, so they haven't perceived that I mean, if that's the solution to the anomaly i'm glad to have that <laughs> thank you over here it's just on why we need journalism in uh, well uh, regarding science communication we need journalists because they can be critical and that's not just in the chocolate story again, because that was a hoax set up by a journalist, by a science journalist. And it was done so to disclose problems within the scientific community, the peer review system, the journals, the open access system. Uh, and that was actually a hoax, so that was actually quite good science journalism, not the bad science journalism. Okay, it was picked up by other media, but most of them non-science science journalists, at least the ones I saw. But that's why we need journalists. We need more like, I can't remember his name, the Gonzo journalist. He's done it before. He does these hopes to kind of disclose the problems within the scientific community. Sure, is there a question? Uh, is there no, it's just a comment. A comment. Fine. Fine. No, Fine. We, we, we kind of outlined it like it uh, was a problem within science, uh, communic uh, with the science journalism that we didn't find these errors, but actually it was quite good science journalism. Thank you. Now, you're, you're close to the stage, so you get the microphone. I get the microphone. Thank you. Then I don't need to shout. I'm Katharina. I'm from the Experimentarium as well. Um, I'm a PhD student there. And I'm just wondering about the, the audience that we're communicating to or with. Um, and uh, I mean, a lot of the things that we've been talking about, it has to do with reading papers and being very self uh, seeking in science news uh, and uh, well thinking about uh, some researchers from the UK that works with science capital uh, and that well most people they don't have a very high science capital and that science capital is much more than content uh, and that's why I think something of what you talked about Megan was very interesting about making more uh, using materials and getting these workshop more like formats uh, 
and uh, involving people and thinking science communication more in that way in community work uh, and also the processual uh, approach to it. Thank you. Uh, and I guess that, that's also where I guess innovation will happen. And if it's meaningful innovation, because what is innovation, as you also said, so, so if it, meaningful innovation for society, I think we need to take a discussion about who are our audiences. Uh, sure, I can. <laughs> I can talk to that. Um, yeah, that's actually a really interesting question and one that I've been thinking about a lot in the last couple of days as I've been uh, meeting with colleagues here in, in Copenhagen. And, um, and I think that's something that researchers of science communication we were just talking about today really need to delve into a bit more deeply. Um, audiences, you know, when we talk about public communication of science, early in my career as a PhD student, I was I sort of stopped using the word public and started using the word publics because they're varied and they're, and uh, people have very different reasons for thinking about science, very different ways of thinking about science, very different doorways into thinking about science. And so one of the things that um, I try to do is, is find these sort of other ways of opening up conversations and opening up dialogue. And, um, and I think that that can happen at museums, that can happen at festivals. But you know, one of the things, um, Maya Horst is here, she's up, up there. You, you've done this in malls and shopping malls <laughs> and all over the place, right? Um, so I think that there's, there's a sort of a way of broadening, a hope of broadening audiences and publics that we invite into this conversation. Can I just ask, do you, do you manage to reach a different audience uh, with these different formats? Um, so yeah, I, the Emerge, the audience for Emerge, the, the festival where we did this, this uh, Future Design Studio the first time, it's a very sort of tech savvy audience, but it's more of an arts audience. They're, they're there because there were um, a lot of artists doing different kinds of installations and things like that. So it's probably a slightly different audience than you would get at a museum and probably a much different audience than you would get reading a um, Scientific American or some other kind of, of, of publication. But again, we do, like one of the things that's so hard is, is that it, it's hard to know who these people are. It's hard to understand audiences. It's a very, they're a very hard, publics are very hard people to know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think you had a comment here. Yes, I had just a, a, a quick one, which is that sometimes it can seem very abstract to talk about opening a, opening a house or opening a new kind of conversation, but sometimes it's very simple. Sometimes it's a question of instead of having a debate or a talk from 6 to 8 in the evening, you have it from 8 to 9 in the morning, you give them free coffee, and you have a totally different audience and a totally different way of talking about things. Sometimes it's a question of having the talk inside the building that you are instead of in the big sort of uh, uh, public uh, official um, uh, hall, then you, you'll invite them into the offices and show 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 people what, what life is like at a newspaper or a media house or a research lab or whatever it is. But it's uh, it can be very easy, small things. Of course, you need to do the big things as well, but the small things work as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say, actually, I want to say hello to the people up there there are people up there yeah yeah will you buy me a beer later on um but the there's a phenomenon called citizen science you know we're talking in very traditional terms about audiences and science journalism and those things are important but you know now you have a major worldwide movement of people across the world in the european citizen science association there's the citizen science association in california it's in australia it's new zealand these are people engaging very directly with science literally in a hands-on kind of way. I mean, people um, exploring their local area, um, people looking at pollution issues, people bird watchers, uh, whale watchers, I mean, the whole genre. And that just isn't featuring in this discussion at all. These are people engaging directly. And the things that are written in the newspapers are not part of that world at all. So we need to think very hard about not just audiences, but the kind of positive messages that are coming out of people through things like citizen science and say, how does that change the nature of science communication? And a lot of the old ways to think about science communication have to change in that kind of context. It has to be much more about responding to those groups rather than simply informing them. Where's it going? So now I'm asking for very small uh, comments. Sure. <laughs> Talking about audience, well, 
we're going to the Ruskula Festival uh, tomorrow, as I just uh, told you guys earlier. And here we're really dealing with a tough audience to reach. I mean, they're young, drunk, just looking out for a party. And we took, me. Like, <laughs> we took probably the, one of the most uh, tough subjects to tell about, the uh, responsible research and innovation, figured out somewhere down in Brussels. And uh, we tried to translate it into something that is actually uh, going to, to uh, to be interesting to the to the people down there, and how how do you do that? I mean, that's it's really been been a tough one, but also really funny to to figure out how to reach people and make them think about what kind of research would I like to to have in the future? What kind of um, well, what kind of kind of future do I see? And uh, it's really going to be interesting to to see what will go on in the next week or so when we have like a hundred thousand young people or people who think they are young. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, come and, and see what's what's going on there. A very short comment here. Yeah. Uh, one last follow-up to, to that question. I think one of the really key things there is again harping on about this processual view, but focusing on on science as craftsmanship, mm -hmm. like not engaging yet at the level of the output, but instead of the actual stuff that's happening, the hands moving, the vials being being poured, that's where you can reach people. It becomes a shortcut through all the usual textbook stuff to a sort of more embodied material encounter with science. So now the situation is that we have 15 minutes left and I have four questions now. Um, so I will ask for short questions and short answers, please. Yeah, hi, my name is a bit of a provocative question in the sense in which I think um, it appears as if as scientists we assume that what we do is by default interesting and we just need to persuade the public that that's the case. But in fact, a lot of science is dead boring and not particularly interesting for everyone. So I'm just wondering, you know, who makes the call? How do we decide what is actually marketable or communicable? And when we make that call, or where, whenever, whoever makes that call makes the call, what are the criteria that we use? So this is really boring, please. <laughs> I think in the end it's the public that buys the newspapers, or it's the journalists that select the stories. It's not the scientists, because they have other uh, criteria. So scientists have other criteria to come uh, to bring over in the public than journalists or the public. They are interested in different things. That's why there's always kind of tension between the groups. Well. Can you imagine anything more boring than law? <laughs> I mean, law as a subject, but uh, but it gets through somehow, you know. So just do the same. You don't you don't need to talk about you know the law in this page of this manual and this and that. In science, we don't need to tell you know the nitty gritty details of the lab book and how many hours I spend moving vials around. Show them how you do that and tell your feelings while you're doing it, your motivations, the consequences of that, of failure. That's what actually will become interesting. And then it will sell itself and then it won't need science communication. <laughs> I think the, uh, the question of, of uh, who makes the call is going back to the old idea of gatekeepers. And I, th I think the gatekeeper idea of, of uh, you have a gatekeeper at the newspaper, you have a gatekeeper well, in different official instances, and I think we sort of need to. Well, you can you can stick to that because there are gatekeepers as, at newspapers, and there should be. But there are also other other strings of communication, and I think that would be the approach that. Well, not all of science is interesting to everybody, of course. Not all of law is interesting to everybody. Not all of literature is interesting to everybody. That's just the way it is. But but there will be communities where. Parts of, of of science is interested is interesting to parts of, of of the public, and they will have their sort of uh, ways. So I'm I'm just saying that we need to not just focus on the gatekeeper of the old school official media. There are there are so many other ways of having a conversation about science. I just want to say very quickly, we're not doing a service to young people if we try to tell them that all science is fun and interesting because it just isn't like that. So yeah. I think part of it is just telling it like it is. 
Uh, and sometimes that won't be picked up at all, and that's absolutely okay. But trying to pretend that science is something different from what we know it is, is not helpful. People will just be switched off, of course. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about money. Uh, no one's really mentioned that, but a lot of these things, a lot of these things that we've been talking about are kind of expensive, you know? Slow, critical journalism, or science theater, or uh, even science cafes. Um, so, Particularly perhaps in the context of, of journalism, where does the money come from to, uh, to fund these kind of interesting, slow activities? <laughs> it's apparently a secret. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> if I could find the money, I'd probably still be running a science theater company. <laughs> Well, when the commissioner talks about the level of investment going on across the, what is it, 28 European countries, and talks about Europe being open for innovation, surely um, this has got to be worth just a little bit of investment, because without a better relationship, you're not going to have any of those things coming to happen. Well, and I, I do think you two, in the past couple of years, it has been featuring more and more prominently in grants call and I mentioned the thing with the Marie Curie scholarship, we've just been contacted by someone who wants to, you know, we have to write a whole page about outreach in a strictly biomedical research application. So I think it's creeping in on the on the policy level, allowing for for uh, for different types of opportunities to, to sneak in. So the money's probably out there somewhere. <laughs> I just heard the other day that uh, some U.S. programmers uh, have developed a software robot that can uh, actually write those short uh, articles so that journalists don't have to do that. And, well, you should think, well, I am I out of a job just in a few months from now? No, the, the point is that actually journalists should focus on writing the long, interesting, slow journalism that we all seem to want here. So uh, maybe that's the way. Maybe science has already given us the answer. Well, there is a lot of money out there. The PhD cup that was mentioned before was uh, funded by one of the big uh, uh, foundations in Denmark with a pharmaceutical uh, uh, background. So there's a lot of private co companies and foundations who, who, who wants to do that, uh, 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 certainly. Now I have two more questions. I have one here and one up there. Hi, my name is Ruth. Um, I have a statement mostly and then a question. So we're hearing a lot of kind of really interesting, maybe I'll go without the microphone, we're hearing a lot of like really interesting tools and ways of engaging people and having that conversation and changing the way science communication is done. But at the end of the day, national surveys consistently show that people get their science information from mass media that's generally written by non-scientific journalists. So I guess, you know, we're putting a lot of effort into changing the way we communicate and, and having that conversation, engaging people, but how do we move people to where we're doing those interesting things? How do we move them away from getting their information from this single, generally a single source, which is newspapers or radio? It's still that way, despite, you know, being in the century we're in now, it's still coming from non-scientific journalists. So how do we, how do we move them into the space we're working in or alternatively move what we're doing into the space they're actually looking for that information. That's more kind of, I don't know if we can answer that question, but mostly for, for everyone really. Mm -hmm. Well, they all, they do get the information about sports, about from journalists who don't do sport. I mean, they may, may have been a sport person before. So I don't think that, see that as a problem, as long as there is someone who wants to go deeper, then there are books well written by scientists and articles and slow, slow journalism in which scientists have been involved and museums where scientists have advised and movies where scientists have been advisors. But I don't think it is a problem that the first wave of news comes from journalists who are not scientists. I mean, it's happened with everything else too. Yeah, well, it's back to the thing I said before about it's communication, not just science communication, because your question assumes that, you know, in order to communicate messages, which involves science, you've got to be a science specialist. Well, if the issue is climate change or innovation or biotechnology and its impact on jobs, a 
I mean, science journalists are one part of that, but they're not the whole thing. And trying to pretend that they've got, I know you don't mean this, but a monopoly on those questions is just not going to work. So perhaps science journalists have got to enter into that <laughs> bigger picture. Um, <laughs> Something went badly wrong there. Um, rather than thinking that somehow you can, again, deal with the science part at, apart from those things. So it's about communication and it's about science in that broader picture rather than trying to feel there's some way you can put boundary lines around. Oh, I think it's safe. Right. So now we go upstairs. Maya, Hi. can you shout, please? Yeah, I can shout. So I'm Maya. She can shout. And, um, I just have a question about the relationship between science communication and science fiction. And the reason why I ask that is because a couple of days ago I tweeted, and you can find me, I'm Maya Holt, I'm in the Twitter feed. I've stopped tweeting because all my gadgets have run out of power, but you know, I'm in the Twitter feed for this event. But a couple of days ago I retweeted something about a colleague from the UK, Jack Stilgo wrote a blog post about what you learn about responsible innovation from watching Jurassic World. And that reminded me about the fact that a lot of people who study science communication say that some of the best science communication is actually found in science fiction. I guess that depends on your perspective, but I'm just curious about whether you have any views on the relationship between science communication done by serious professionals as opposed to science communication done in science fiction? <laughs> well, I do. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of movements, one very strong in the US and then one starting up in, in the UK, where scientists are setting up mechanisms for filmmakers to get reasonable advice from scientists without being told permanently, you're wrong, you're wrong, this is wrong, <laughs> you're simplifying and so on. So these are a group of scientists who are aware that science fiction and movie making in general is not about communicating science, it's about selling tickets to the cinema. So it has to be entertaining and what's the difference then between scientists being involved and not being involved? Well, scientists have to make themselves useful to the filmmaker and they will make themselves useful if they show them the filmmaker that sound science in the movie helps make a better film not better science communication but a better film and i think a, a big a, whether you like it or not is another question but interstellar was an example of that and there are a few others around um, I, I think i would perhaps kind of question the division of labor there because in a way some of the best science fiction authors are hard-working serious professionals and some of the best scientists are totally dreamers so so in a way the the the, the boundaries between what's 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 imagination and what's uh, what's kind of hard detective like digging for facts isn't that that different both both fields require those things to make them successful and I think what it boils down to is that we often fall back to this really two-dimensional, boring version of what science is, right? It's just intuitively echoes up something that's dull and, and uh, incomprehensible, and that's just not right, right? It, there's so much more to it. So, so perhaps one of the things to do is just to question that boundary and say, dreamers, there is as much dream in science as there is in science fiction. I would also say to question the boundary between science communication and science fiction a little bit, because when I think about myself as an individual having a relationship or an understanding of what science is or what any particular scientific topic is, that my understanding is, is composed of what I've read from the science world, what I've seen in science fiction movies. It, it, I, don't, I can't separate that in my mind when I go to think about a, a, any specific issue in science, um, uh, in the sciences or any specific topic in the sciences. To, so I would say that those are those are fuzzy boundaries as well. I think it's really interesting to turn the question around and say, you know, one of the things that might have made Jurassic World a, a more interesting film is using science. So, and that was one of the things that people reacted to positively about the first Jurassic Park. It was stretching science, but it, there was something interesting about it and interestingly plausible. So why don't 
filmmakers think, despite all of the effort that we talk about in terms of science communication, that that would have just, in terms of the drama, made it interesting if they'd used some of the latest things that have been discovered about dinosaurs since Jurassic Park was made, because they haven't picked that up at all. So it's a kind of a failure of science communication, in a way, that for all that effort, somehow the idea that that could actually make the thing, which I believe it would have done, more interesting and more compelling, simply doesn't come across. So how, how, can, we, how can we get that message through? Uh, how can we do that? I would also say there's some wonderful thing, wonderful instances where creating science fiction actually led to leaps forward or advances in science. Uh, and one more, one sort of recent example is Interstellar. Um, the images that they created of the black hole are some of the most um, scientifically accurate images they've ever had of black holes. And then they they simplified them for the actual movie, but they created these scientific images um, in order to be able to create. Uh, the images for the movie and there are lots of examples um, throughout sort of science fiction film history where that kind of thing has happened. So this is the very very last question or comment please. It's a comment. Yeah. I think what we need to get from and to is we've seen a lot of product placement in movies. We know when they advertise a certain iPhone or a certain car maybe we should get to the place where we advertise or get to agenda placing in movies so setting the agenda of climate change, for instance, in the new House of Cards or whatever. I think that would be a good idea. So that was the last word, because now we're out of town. Science placement in movies, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> and because we are out of ta time, and we're also out of oxygen, and we are out of beer. <laughs> so now I want you to make two rounds of applause. The first one is for the panel. And the second one is, of course, as I said in the beginning, for the civilized person who came from the UK to introduce us to this wonderful format of debating. So a big round of applause for Sarah, please. Um, but the reason that I'm here working in Copenhagen, I work at the university, is that I think uh, Copenhagen and Denmark are the most exciting places in the world for science communication. Um, and I really love these meetups because I get to mine some of that experience and what's going on. We do these every couple of months, every one after the summer. Check the Facebook page for more details. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for watching. <laughs>